I was born in 1910 in Paris. My father was a gentle, easygoing person, a salad of racial genes, a Swiss citizen of mixed French and Austrian descent, with a dash of the Danube in his veins. I am going to pass around in a minute some lovely glossy blue picture postcards. He owned a luxurious hotel on the Riviera. His father and two grandfathers had sold wine, jewels and silk, respectively. At 30, he married an English girl, daughter of Jerome Dun, the alpinist, and granddaughter of two Dorset Parsons, experts in obscure subjects, paleopiodology and aeolian harps, respectively. My very photogenic mother died in a freak accident, picnic, lightning, when I was three, and, save for a pocket of warmth in the darkest past, Nothing of her subsists within the halls and dells of memory, over which, if you can still stand my style, I'm writing this under observation, the sun of my infancy had set. Surely, you all know those redolent remnants of day suspended with the midges about some hedge in bloom of suddenly or suddenly entered and traversed by the rambler at the bottom of a hill in the summer dusk, a furry warmth golden midges. My mother's elder sister, Sibyl, whom a cousin of my father's had married and then neglected, served in my immediate family as a kind of unpaid governess and housekeeper. Somebody told me later that she had been in love with my father and that he had light-heartedly taken advantage of it one rainy day and forgotten it by the time the weather cleared. I was extremely fond of her, despite the rigidity the fatal rigidity of some of her rules. Perhaps she wanted to make of me, in the fullness of time, a better widower than my father. Aunt Sibyl had pink-rimmed azure eyes and a waxen complexion. She wrote poetry. She was poetically superstitious. She said she knew she would die soon after my 16th birthday, and did. Her husband, a great traveler in perfumes spent most of his time in America, where eventually he founded a firm and acquired a bit of real estate. I grew a happy, healthy child in a bright world of illustrated books, clean sand, orange trees, friendly dogs, sea vistas, and smiling faces. Around me the splendid Hotel Mirana revolved as a kind of private universe, a whitewashed cosmos within the blue greater one that blazed outside. From the aproned pot scrubber to the flanneled potentate, everybody liked me, everybody petted me. Elderly American ladies leaning on their canes listed towards me like towers of Pisa. Ruined Russian princesses who could not pay my father bought me expensive bonbons. He, mon cher petit papa, took me out boating and biking, taught me to swim and dive and water ski, read read to me Don Quixote and Le Miserable, and I adored and respected him, and felt glad for him whenever I overheard the servants discuss his various lady friends, beautiful and kind beings who made much of me and could and shed precious tears over my cheerful motherlessness. I attended an English day school a few miles from home, and there I played rackets and fives, and got excellent marks and was on perfect terms with schoolmates and teachers alike. The only definite sexual events that I can remember as having occurred before my, terth before my 13th birthday, that is, before I first saw my little Annabelle, were a solemn, decorous and purely theoretical talk about pubertal surprises in the rose garden of the school with an American kid the song of a then-celebrated motion picture actress whom he seldom saw in three-dimensional world, and some interesting reactions on the part of my organism to certain photographs, pearl and umbra, with infinitely soft partings, in Pichon's sumptuous La Butte Humaine, that I had filched from under a mountain of marble-bound graphics in the hotel library. Later, in his delightful De Bonne Manet, 
my father gave me all the information he thought I needed about sex. This was just before sending me in the autumn of 1923 to a lycée in Lyon, where we were to spend three winters. But alas, in the summer of that year, he was touring Italy with Madame de R and her daughter, and I had nobody to complain to, nobody to consult. <laughs>